Hi everybody. Hope you're all having a good day today so far. Today we are going to be talking about the lexicographic preference. Now, the lexicographic preference is a classic example in microeconomics to show that not all preference orderings can be represented by utility functions. And uh, the lexicographic preference also gives us some insight into what features uh, preferences do have to have in order to guarantee that they will be representable by utility functions. Now, uh, for those reasons, I think I can just about guarantee that the lexicographic preference is something that you will encounter in your first microeconomics course in a graduate program. Now, you'll uh, recall that in a previous lecture, we conjectured that every complete preorder is representable by a utility function. And then we define this lexicographic preference, as the word, this lexicographic preference that we're going to spend some time with uh, today, understanding. And then we presented this theorem that says the lexicographic preference is a complete preorder. In fact, it's a total order, but it's not representable by a utility function. So what that means is that the lexicographic preference or order is, um, is a counterexample to the conjecture. That is a counterexample showing that the conjecture that we made is false. That it's not true that every complete preorder is representable by a utility function. Uh, and then we went on to present the representation theorem, which tells us that every complete continuous preorder is indeed uh, representable by a utility function. And notice that what that kind of says as well is that the lexicographic preference must be not continuous because it is a complete preorder, as we've said here in the theorem. And so if it were also continuous, then this theorem says it would be representable. But we know that it's not representable. In fact, we're going to prove today that it's not representable. Uh, so here's the definition again of the lexicographic preference, and we're going to go through the details of that definition in a moment. But first, uh, recall as well that I gave you a couple of exercises in that previous lecture, um, and I said at the time that you should do those exercises, do them on your own, because it will be quite valuable for you to do that. And so I say that yet again today, if you haven't actually done those exercises, I strongly recommend that you do them by yourself, do them on your own. Well, you don't have to do them by yourself. You can do them with, with someone else <laughs> um, before uh, you watch the rest of this video where I'm going to go through some of the details of, the, of these exercises. Uh, it's much better for you to, to work on them yourself first than just to do nothing but watch me do it. You can learn by doing rather than just learn by watching. Okay, so uh, let's get started with that first exercise. And what's, the, uh, what's going on in this exercise? It says that what we want to do is we want to take a typical arbitrary point or bundle in R2+, plus, and then we want to find out some things about it. Let's start by drawing R2 plus and an arbitrary point in R2 plus. Call it X bar. There's the first component. There's the second component of X bar. And now, um, what do we want to do? We want to, we want to determine the upper the strict upper and lower contour sets of x-bar, the weak upper and lower contour sets of x-bar, and the indifference curve or indifference set 
through X bar, containing X bar. Uh, let's start with the weak upper contour set of the point of this bundle. Now, for the weak upper contour set, that's all the bundles, all the points, that are at least as good as X bar to this consumer. And so, for that weak upper contour set, X bar here is actually playing the role of X, the pair X1, X2, in the definition. And so, which points, which bundles are at least as good as X bar, according to this definition? Well, this says that if the first component of a point, of a bundle, is strictly bigger than the first component of X bar, strictly bigger than X1 bar, that is, if a bundle has more of the first good than X bar does, then it's at least as good as X bar. So all these points over here to the right of X bar are at least as good as X bar. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw the vertical line through X bar in this blue color here. And all the points to the right, strictly to the right of that blue line, are at least as good as X bar. They're in the weak upper contour set of X bar. What about the points on the blue line, like these? Well, all those points have the same first component as X, as X bar. X1 for those is equal to X1 bar. And uh, so it's the second part of the statement in the brackets here that is applicable. And so that's because there X1 prime equals X1, or X1 bar for us, because X bar is playing the role of X. And so uh, it, that's what comes into play. And as it says, it's those points whose second component is at least as big as the second component of X bar that are at least as good as X bar. So that's all the points or bundles on the blue line above X bar and X bar itself. So all of those points to the right and on the blue line above, those are all at least as good as X bar. Are there any other points that are at least as good as X bar? Well, clearly, all the points strictly to the left of the blue line have a smaller first component than X1 bar, so they are not as good as X bar. And all the points on the blue line strictly below X bar have the same first component, but a smaller second component. So those also are not as good as X bar. So the set of points, those points that are as good as or better than X bar is exactly the set of points to the right of the blue line, on the blue line above, and X bar itself, those are the points that comprise the upper contour set of X bar, the weak upper contour set of X bar, because it includes points that are just, just as good but not better. And I'm going to use the notation capital U of X bar for the upper, the weak upper contour set of X bar. What about the weak lower contour set of X bar? Well, the same argument tells us that the bundles or points to the, strictly to the left of the blue line are worse than X bar to this consumer, and all the points on the blue line below X bar are, let's say, as bad as X bar. X bar is at least as good as them. And of course, again, X bar is at least as good as itself. So the lower contour set of X bar is all the points to the left and all the points on the blue line below X bar and X bar itself. And I'm going to use L of X bar for the lower contour set, the weak lower contour set of X bar. And now, what about the indifference curve or indifference set containing X bar? Well, the, the points that are indifferent, that the consumer is indifferent between them and X bar, are exactly the points that are as good as, and if you like, as bad as, X bar. Equally as good, or equally as bad, um, uh, as, X, as good as or better, 
as bad as or worse than X bar. And so it's the intersection, the indifference curve or class of X bar is the intersection of the weak upper contour set and the weak lower contour set. And that intersection is just X bar itself by itself. So the indifference set or the equivalence class of X bar is just the singleton set consisting of only X bar. That is, the indifference curves, <laughs> if you like here, aren't really curves, they're just points. They're singleton sets, they're points, but they're, of course, it's the set consisting of the point. So all of the indifference curves or sets in the space are singleton sets. Every point is an indifference set unto itself. You can put this another way, we could say that for this, this consumer uh, is never indifferent between X bar and any other bundle. And that's true for every bundle. So for this consumer, this consumer is never indifferent between any two distinct, between any two distinct bundles. Uh, so that covers the weak upper and lower contour sets and the uh, indifference set. What about the strict upper and lower contour sets? Well, those are easy. The strict upper contour set is everything in the upper contour set, everything that's at, at least as good as X bar, but not indifferent to X bar. And of course, then that's the only thing that comes out. So the strict upper contour set is everything to the right, everything on the blue line above X bar, but not X bar. That's the weak, sorry, that's the strict upper contour set of X bar. And I'm going to use the same notation with a little circle for the strict upper contour set of X bar. And I'm going to do the same for the strict lower contour set of X bar. L with a little circle. That's all the points strictly to the left of the blue line, all the points on the blue line below X bar, but not X bar. So we have the strict lower contour set, the strict upper contour set, and the set consisting of X bar, of course, that's a partition of R2 plus into the three, the three partition elements, the three equivalence classes with respect to X bar, the ones that are strictly better, the ones that are strictly worse, and X bar itself. Okay, I think now we've uh, developed a pretty good geometric understanding and uh, intuition about the lexicographic preference in this first exercise here. So let's uh, take uh, just a few moments to look at the second exercise before we get into the proof uh, of the theorem that we're going to do. So in the second exercise, there's two parts in the exercise. First part says we want to verify that the lexicographic preference uh, is a total order, which means we have to show that it is transitive, that it's complete, and that it's anti-symmetric. Now those are all pretty straightforward. I think you can do those for yourself. I'm not going to do those here. The second part of the exercise says that we want to show that the lexicographic preference is not continuous. It's a pre-order, but it's not a continuous pre-order. And so uh, we can take a few moments to do that, I think, here. And so uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to recall uh, is our definition of a continuous pre-order. So we have said that a pre-order is continuous if all of the upper and lower contour sets, I should say all of the strict upper and strict lower contour sets in the, in the space are all open sets. Say it another way, for any point in the set, in the space, like X bar, it has to be the case that both the strict upper contour set and the strict lower contour set of that point have to be open sets. And that has to be true for all the points in the space. And, of course, an equivalent alternative definition is in terms of closed sets. We would say that it's got to be the case that for any point, both the weak upper contour set and the weak lower contour set have to be closed sets. So we could take either approach, open sets, closed sets. Let's take the open set approach. 
means we're going to be looking at the strict upper and lower contour sets. And so let's start with the strict upper contour set of this point X bar. So that set, we have to show that set's open. And of course, to show that a set is open, we have to show that for any point in the set, we can always find an open ball around the point that is itself entirely contained in the set. So, for example, this point here, indeed, clearly, there is an open ball around that point, and the open ball is completely contained in U circle. It is a subset of U circle. That will be true for any of the points to the right of the blue line, and that would be true even, for example, for a point very close to the, to the uh, blue line. Let's put one real close here. It's clear here. We, could still, uh, we can still find a, an open ball around that point that's, in, that's a subset of U-circle. It's entirely contained in U-circle. It would just be a very small little open ball. Not a problem. Now, what about the points here not strictly to the right of the blue line, but on the blue line above X bar, those points are all in the strict upper contour set U circle. And, of course, if we take any one of those points, any open ball around that point is going to contain points that are not in the strict upper contour set. They're not in U circle. And so that tells us immediately Number one, U circle, the strict upper contour set of X bar, is not an open set. And that tells us immediately that the uh, lexicographic preference is not continuous. It's a, it's a preorder, but it's not a continuous preorder. Now, we could, of course, do the same thing had we started with the lower, the strict lower contour set. We could have taken uh, uh, an arbitrary point on the blue line below X bar, that's in the strict lower contour set, and of course that open ball will contain points that are not in the strict lower contour set, not in L circle. So that would be an alternative way to see that the uh, lexicographic preference is not continuous. And had we taken the uh, closed set approach and worked with the weak upper and lower contour sets, we could, for example, have taken a sequence of points in the weak upper contour set. Every point in the sequence is in the weak upper contour set. And it's a sequence that converges to this point here, which is not in the weak upper contour set. So that tells me the weak upper contour set is not a closed set. And we can do the same thing for the weak lower contour set, a sequence of points all in the, lower, the weak lower contour set, converging to a point not in the weak lower contour set. Either way, we show that the corresponding weak upper or lower contour set's not closed, which verifies, again, taking the opposite approach, that the uh, lexicographic preference is not a continuous uh, preorder. And so now uh, I think we'll take a little break uh, before we come back for the second half of the lecture and prove the uh, theorem that we, want to, that we want to provide a proof for, and that is the theorem that says the lexicographic preference is not representable by a utility function. So we'll take a little break here and then we'll come back and we'll do that proof.